Good morning, good day, and good evening. Thank you for joining our second mini seminar on current affairs, questioning, questioning if Russia is back to the grand chessboard by looking into recent developments in four countries, Niger, Azerbaijan, Kosovo, and Gaza. My name is Svetlusha Surova, and I'm the founder and senior researcher at Minority Issues Research Institute. And again, I have the honor and pleasure to welcome you all today on behalf of the organizer. We have with us today four experts, Dr. Angela Gappa from California State University, Dr. Nikolos Esitashvili from Georgian Institute of Public Affairs, Dr. Besford Rezai from University of Pristina, and Dr. Muhammad Kochak from Ankara Social Sciences University. They all have extensive knowledge of respective countries affected by recent conflicts, and they will try to shed light on these events and explore the extent to which they are part of the Russian geopolitical chess game. I would like to thank the experts for taking their precious time out and making it to this event. Our senior researcher, Dr. Mirsad Kriestorat, will moderate the discussion. Thank you, Mirsad, for leading again the panel and for putting it together. Also, thanks goes to all participants for being present here today. And besides a timely topic, I must emphasize that today we are covering an unbelievable 12 time zones from 6 a.m. in Chico City in California to 6 p.m. in Tbilisi, Georgia. I'm handing the floor now to Mirsad and our experts. Enjoy discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Svetlusha. Um, and thank you, everyone. Hello. Um, whenever in the world you are, uh, wherever you are joining us from, I understand we have people from Africa, from the Caucasus, from uh, from the United States, from um, many places around the globe, which is uh, truly awesome. So the question we would like to shed some light on today is, is, is if Russia is back to the grand chessboard. Over the past few months, a little over a year after the latest war in Ukraine started by Russian invasion, we had several flash, significant flashpoints happening in the various regions around the world. And we are today to discuss and see how these flashpoints are relating to each other, at least on that dimension of the Russian foreign policy objectives. So today we're going to have a conversation about these four recent international flashpoints with experts from those regions who are well-versed in both local, regional, and international dynamics. So to recap briefly, let's remember that on July 26, Niger's military overturned the democratically elected president of that African country of the Sahel region, while Russian Wagner paramilitary units were nearby in the neighboring Mali. On September 19th, Azerbaijan moved to take full control of the remaining Nagorno-Karabakh region from the Armenians in the South, South Caucasus, while Russian troops were monitoring supposed peace between the two sides. On September 24th, more than 30 heavily armed, presumably Serbian men, took over a small village in North Kosovo in the Southern Balkans, some 80 miles south of Russia's out post called Humanitarian Center, which many see as the Russian spy center, if not more. Then on, September, on October 7th, the current ongoing war, war in and around Gaza began, rattling the entire Middle East region with Russian military and paramilitary troops in neighboring Syria. It appears, it appears, and I emphasize that it appears, um, that the international community was surprised by the events, while in every case, Russian military and paramilitary forces were stationed nearby, closing, closely observing developments while not getting directly involved. Now it remains to be understood to what extent and how each case is related to Russian foreign policy goals, and how today's experts will help us see that big picture and understand if and how these events could be related. Now, I will also now briefly introduce our panelists so that everybody is more familiar with them. Dr. Angela Gappa is an associate professor at, of international relations in the Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice at the California State University in Chico. 
Her research focuses on international relations and war, conflict, and security. She is particularly interested in the resource curse and on the broader implications of non-renewable natural resources on development, democracy, and conflict. Her regional focus is Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Gapa is originally from Africa herself, and she is well-versed in local African political dynamics and developments. Dr. Nicholas Asitashvili is an affiliated professor at the Georgian Institute of Public Affairs. I would like to say Gruzian Institute of Public Affairs, right? And an invited lecturer at an international school of economics at BDC State University. His, uh, research, he researches international security alliances and specifically NATO post-Cold War, increasingly society characteristics of the international system. Dr. Basford Erechai is an associate professor of law at the University of Pristina, Hassan Pristina, Faculty of Law in the Department of International Law. Dr. Rechai has a hefty resume and he served in various roles of which we can mention that he was a senior legal advisor for Constitutional Court of Kosovo. He was also a chief executive officer at the Agency for European Integration. He was senior policy advisor for the Ministry of European Integration and the same role for Ministry of Foreign Affairs and others. Um, final panelist for today is Dr. Mohamed Korchak, who is an assistant professor at a Regional Studies Institute of Ankara Social Science University. His research focuses on international security, Russia and Turkey. His most recent book, Turkey's Russian Relations in the 21st Century, Cooperation and Competition Amid, Amid Systemic Turbulence, was published last year in 2022. Dr. Korchak is an expert on Turkey's foreign policy as well as Russian policies over the Turkic world and the Middle East. As usual for this type of seminars, we are going to first hear a short introductory presentation by our panelists for up to 10 minutes. Please keep it like that. And then after that, we will open the discussion for your questions and answers. The presentations will be done in a chronological order, meaning the first one which occurred, we'll start with that one and we'll finish with the last one where we will essentially uh, organize our presentation like from Africa over the Caucasus, followed by the Balkans. And then it, this part presentation will end with the Middle East situation. After that, if anyone from the audience wants to ask a question in person, please raise the hand icon and we will call upon you. Once your microphone is on, please introduce yourself and please tell us where are you joining us from? And then ask your question. Those who cannot join over the microphone for any reason, you're welcome to type in your question in the chat box and we'll try to ask them on your behalf. Again, thank you all for the cooperation. And now let us turn our attention to Dr. Gapa, who is going to elaborate on the changes in Niger and African Sahel region. Dr. Gapa, please take over. All right, thank you very much. Let me see if I can share my presentation real quick. All right. Okay, okay so good morning. Uh, my name is Angela Gapa. I'm an associate professor of international relations at California State University in Chico, California. My presentation will mainly look at uh, Russia's inroads into the Sahel region. Uh, it's better to look at it from the regional perspective uh, because Niger is just one domino in a, num a series of coups that have occurred in this region. Um, so the Sahel region uh, extends from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Red Sea and covers countries like Senegal, Mali, Niger, Chad, Sudan, and Eritrea. Recently, in the last four years, three to four years, it has uh, gained a new moniker as the coup belt, uh, as it has been host to eight uh, coups, uh, predominantly in uh, former French colonies. And one stock feature of these coups uh, is that the public sentiment has manifested as, uh, firstly, this anti-Western, anti-French uh, rhetoric that's coupled with a celebration 
of Russia's presence, uh, you see protests and demonstrations waving Russian flags. Um, so in the wake of Mali's uh, political crisis, which was one of the earlier countries in the Sahel region, which experienced a uh, coup, uh, there were reports that junta leaders were trained in Russia, uh, have ties to the Kremlin. Uh, the post-coup military prime minister in that uh, country, Chogol Maiga, is a graduate of the Moscow Technical University of Telecommunications and a fervent advocate of closer ties with Russia. Uh, so either way you look at it, it's evident that Russia has positioned itself as a torchbearer of anti-Western, particularly anti-French sentiment in the coup belt. Uh, most of Russia's direct engagement in the Sahel region has been through the Wagner Group, uh, which is the Russian state-funded private military company controlled uh, until 2023 by Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, the former ally of the Russian president. Uh, during the Russia-Africa summit, which coincided with the coup in Niger, we saw Vladimir Putin supporting the coup, Prigozhin offering Wagner services should they be needed. Uh, so Russia's growing influence in the region uh, through the reestablishment of old ties and the creation of new ones has been perceived as a quest to reestablish the geopolitical gains that the Soviet Union achieved uh, before its collapse in 1989. Uh, so my presentation will mainly be focusing on what instruments Russia has been utilizing to exert this influence in the region, um, what are the potential opportunities and threats of Russian presence in West Africa and the Sahel region, and what do Africans themselves have to say about this? So there are three main questions. Uh, so these uh, are the main questions that I'm going to be uh, looking at. And while uh, Putin's Russia has no visible grand uh, plan, um, it has a pattern of engagement that um, has been structured around three main goals. Uh, the first is to maximize profits through commercial predation by proxies. Uh, thus helping to evade Western sanctions against Russia that were imposed uh, as a result of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, the second is to disrupt and erode Western influence in Africa. And the third is to strengthen Russia's uh, geopolitical influence uh, within the region. And in order to achieve this, Russia has relied on three main tactics. Um, the first is through information campaigns or you could call them misinformation campaigns, so propaganda and rhetoric that overinflates historical tries with the region and is particularly aimed at a uh, young, uh, young Sahelian uh, generation. Uh, Russia created the Russia-African Alternative Partnership for Economic Development with chapters in multiple countries in the Sahel region. Members have appeared at uh, pro-coup protests declaring their support for junta regimes and their hope for partnership with Russia. Russian proxies have also tried to manipulate African public opinion through social media uh, one, and, and also through movies. One such movie is one entitled The Tourist, uh, which was produced uh, in Central African Republic. And in this movie, the Russians are portrayed as good, UN peacekeepers and uh, 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 portrayed as useless and weak, uh, and the French colonialists are viewed as these scheming villains. Uh, the movie actually uses local actors and was shot on location in context that would uh, be very relevant to young Sahelians. And in this information campaign, uh, Russia per portrays itself as a staunch supporter of African nations, seeking autonomy and sovereignty, emphasizing historical narratives of Cold War solidarity, such as providing education opportunities, military support. Um, and in addition, these efforts have allowed uh, Russia to garner support and votes in the United Nations uh, all the while diverting attention from uh, criticisms against Putin's uh, aggress aggressive uh, effort on Ukraine. Uh, Russia thus is a central agent in sowing uh, resentment against France and other Western powers in the region. The second tactic that Russia has used in the coup belt is to make its uh, presence known through 
the establishment of protective clientelistic alliances, uh, typically with unaccountable, undemocratically elected leaders. Russia sees instability and conflict uh, as opportunities to sell African combatants in the Sahel region weapons, uh, provide them with military training, uh, military advising, as well as mercenary services through the Wagner Group. Russian weapon sales um, have actually increased from 500 million over uh, to, to over 2 billion annually in the last decade. So Af uh, Russia now sees broader, deeper interventions to influence African countries' conflicts, governance, economies, and security architectures, all to facilitate Russian commercial activities and predation. And the third tactic is probably the most obvious. Uh, Russia uses uh, through, uh, networks in which to seek predatory profit, uh, particularly through the extraction of natural resources uh, without really contributing to the region's economic development. And part of what makes Niger geopolitically important uh, is that they are the seventh largest uh, producer of uranium in the world. Uh, uranium, of course, is utilized in the production of nuclear power as well as nuclear weapons. Niger also has minerals and oil reserves, as well as has a strategic positioning in the fight against Islamic militants that make them even more important to uh, other superpowers like the United States and Russia and China, uh, Europe and China. Um, within the coup belt, gold dominates Mali's natural resource sector. Uh, Mali is the fourth uh, largest uh, gold producer in Africa. Uh, so the Wagner Group, through its uh, wild, wide portfolio of services in various sectors, um, has had, uh, you know, basically its hand in multiple parts in different uh, mining activities as well as extractive activities within the Sahel region. Here, we see the Wagner Group being the primary proxy seeking trade deals from elites in exchange for security-related services that are to safeguard the uh, people in power, not the uh, security of the countries uh, more broadly. Uh, Wagner's business model has included political backing and guidance, information campaigns, logistical support for African clients, uh, under which it receives the rights to exploit the country's um, main mineral resources. So when explaining such events uh, like the Russian inroads into uh, the Sahel, there tends to be geopolitical bias, a lens that filters every incident through the prism of international grand strategy. Um, so I would like to end this presentation by looking at what uh, some of the local sentiments have been uh, among Africans within the region. Uh, so as with any part of the world, there is polarized views in uh, the Sahel region. Um, you have those who are staunch proponents of Russian engagement and influence. Uh, upon the death of Prigozhin, you had uh, tributes uh, celebrating the life that of someone who a lot of youth viewed as a hero uh, from saving you know, the Sahel region of, from the clutches of French neocolonial uh, grip. You have social media influencers, particularly Natalie Yam, uh, who has been known as the lady from Sochi. So she tweets furiously anti-French rhetoric and pro-Russia uh, rhetoric to her a half a million followers on Instagram. But also Wagner's activities have included some grave human rights abuses and increased uh, in regional instability. It is therefore not surprising that the worst critics are sometimes only giving their testimony through the veil of anonymity. In one interview, one witness described how Wagner mercenaries had killed civilians, including uh, village chief hostage, a village chief hostage, uh, who denied knowledge of the whereabouts of rebels. Uh, so they accused him of harboring the rebels and shot him. Uh, and then in another, an entire family, including children uh, who were driving in a land cruiser uh, that was assumed to belong to rebels were all killed. Uh, another um, criticism is 
from local business leaders in countries around the Sahel region who have described how due to the broad sectoral portfolio um, that Wagner has through its foray in mining, in information, in security, in logistics, that is crowded out local businesses out of entire sectors of the economy. So in conclusion, um, we do see a significant uh, presence of Russia, uh, which um, clues us into a broader geopolitical strategy, but the ultimate effect is that it is perpetuating um, views that force uh, the rule of force as opposed to democratic ideals and endorses corruption over transparency, drains local development, uh, and also supports authoritarian regimes Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gapa. Um, uh, we now go to caucuses. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, please take over. Thank you so much. Let me share my PowerPoints with you. Mm -hmm. All right, can you see the PowerPoints? Yes. And can you hear me too? Yes. Excellent. My name is Nika Esitashvili. First of all, let me express my uh, gratitude for being invited to your uh, event and uh, my gratitude and uh, uh, respect. Um, thank you to the audience for taking part in the event. And let's get down to business. So, uh, like, my name is Nika Esitashvili. Uh, I represent a couple of universities, and I work for a, a National Defense Academy. That's an academy which raises Junkers. Uh, like, uh, Junkers, that is, like, uh, basically military, future military for Georgia. And uh, my like uh, research basically uh, tries to understand what Russia uh, tries to do in Caucasus. Basically, NATO, Russia, and the, what this in, Russia's influence implies for the new world order, but specifically for Caucasus. And I try to understand it from, from the theoretical prism of English school, which I call basically a healthy mix of idealism and materialism. That's materialism. That is what basically uh, the power and like uh, uh, distribution of power uh, and then what ideas, norms and values uh, imply for uh, uh, international relations. Uh, so here we have Mirsheimer on the one hand who suggests that, yeah, materialism, power, and all those things are important. And on the other side, we have, who is this? You might know, this is Schumann, a German guy who became a French representative, yeah? Very strange, yeah? After the World War II, the guy represents France, French a prime minister. And uh, would you kind of believe that somebody who is like uh, German would be representing France? Would French trust him? Would Jean Monnet trust him? Yeah, Jean Monnet would probably trust him. And he trusted him. So this guy kind of like uh, did very fine things for Germany. And this is what I want you to push. Yeah. Russia might be doing bad things, but maybe one day Russia is going to start good things too, as extreme as it might seem at, seem at this moment. Well, English school again, Hadley Bull, Martin White, Barry Buzan. And the theory where I'm pushing you to is like a regional security complex theory. This regional security complex theory basically suggests that like uh, we have caucuses here that has its own identity. There is Europe, there is Asia, there is Africa, there is South America. And despite the fact that material conditions might be pushing us in one unipolar or uniform condition, there are like values, norms, and ideas which might like pushing us from homogeneity to like, like this 
multi like diverse understanding of the world and there are different like uh, uh, scholars that like for example you might uh, recall him alexander went a constructivist who kind of like also suggests that we think in more multiverse like uh, diverse universe um, uh, uh, way so again like to make things a little bit easier let's get down to to like uh, caucuses and here when we um, when we think about caucuses when we concentrate on caucuses it is crucial to mention russia who has a claim to the region so when we think about regions like uh, we need to understand one important thing that it's not that russia is becoming like uh, Mm, uh, uh, a country who is laying a claim on Caucasus. Russia sees itself as a country uh, mm, uh, which always was an owner of Caucasus, at least since the 19th century. It is now that Europe or United States are encroaching on Caucasus. And what's happening right now is that it's simply russia is feeling like vulnerable at least according to the regional security complex theory russia is feeling vulnerable and unfortunately if we eval evaluate the strength of russia it's feeling vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis to turkey vis-a-vis -vis even to iran and vis-a-vis -vis to of course europe and united states so if we like uh think about ideas norms and values that are being spread in the world and vis-a-vis -vis to material power yeah we'll see that russia has real like um, uh, uh, objective reasons to be vulnerable about so in our classification there is turkey which is an insulator state in caucasus russia is a regional great power you and europe are like those countries which are encroaching on russia and are making it feel vulnerable so turkey russia Russia's region and countries around it. So regional security uh, um, uh, complex in which focus is, is located in, in a centered region and the center is like Russia in which there are countries which are like, in, um, imagine uh, like uh, uh, Russia in the center of the region, focus is a small part of the region and then all other countries encroaching on Russia. And there are also 25 million Russians living in those, in that region, in that region, regional security complex. And uh, whenever like um, uh, Putin feels himself a little bit like vulnerable, he uses these Russians as a bait, you know, and claims there are over 25 million Russians living in neighboring states. And according to this Russian government, there is threat to their lives. And I have to protect these people from those foreigners. And like he genuinely feels this, or maybe he does not. We, we don't really know. There might be really a patriotic sentiment in him, or maybe he uses them as a bait, like to lay like claim to the region, which he thinks is his own. So I like encourage you to think in like uh, um, like um, uh, um, like uh, to try to understand the mindset of Putin or any like uh, uh, ruler of uh, Russia, Yeltsin. Or let's go back to like 19th century, like uh, rulers of Russia. The second important organization in Russia's regional security complex is Guam. Guam is Georgia, Ukraine, like Azerbaijan and Moldova. They are challengers of Russia too. These uh, uh, challengers, they have created like an organization that want to actually get rid of Russia. And like they, they basically are kind of, uh, uh, kind of like trying to um, uh, uh, organize themselves and create like uh, an alliance to make sure that like they dispose of Russia and Russia sees another threat coming from them. So when we are talking about uh, Russia's role in the Western Balkans, mainly we are talking about uh, states that have not been uh, uh, able to join the Euro uh, European Union, uh, mainly 
we are talking about uh, Kosovo, um, North Macedonia, Albania, Montenegro, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So these are all uh, states that are in the process of um, uh, integration into the European Union. However, when we are talking about NATO, we are talking uh, only about three uh, states that are still in the path of joining NATO. And uh, these are uh, Kosovo, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, Russia's uh, concrete influence here, and uh, uh, we should, uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, take consideration of the over overall geopolitical situation and um, uh, the location of Western Balkans. Uh, in this regards, we see, when we see Western Balkans, we see that uh, this piece of land and states that are represented in this geographical position are actually uh, surrounded by uh, Euro-Atlantic member states, uh, which in a way uh, provides a healthy barrier or cushion against Russia's influence. And um, having under consideration this geopolitical situation, um, uh, the attention goes then uh, how and uh, um, uh, what are the means that Russia is influencing and uh, trying to destabilize the region in the Western Balkans. And in this regards, uh, of course, we, we uh, refer to uh, a, a state that is within this region that is enabling Russia's influence in the Western Balkans. And this state is uh, Serbia as an independent state and also Republika Srpska, uh, which is part of uh, or a constituent part of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Serbia and Republika Srpska are the main enablers states that are uh, enabling uh, Russia to actually uh, not only attend, but also to materialize its malign influence in the, in the region. Uh, this is a co very complex relationship. Uh, in a, in a way, it's um, uh, it's a, an alliance of convenience between uh, Serbia and Russia, uh, which is uh, also transactional uh, relationship, which uh, includes many aspects in this regards. And we have uh, uh, material uh, military relationships as well as uh, broader political geopolitical um aspects of it as well as religious uh, alliance meaning uh, orthodox uh, brotherhood and uh, relationships uh, in this regards um so um how is that uh, translated into concrete uh, actions and malign uh, i would say malign actions in the in destabilization of the of the region um russia is um, and, and serbia are uh, convenient uh, have a convenient uh, alliance of conveniency because on one side Russia is um, uh, help uh, upholding uh, Serbia's opposition to Kosovo's independence, and how is uh, it doing is through mainly through uh, let's say use or abuse I would say of its uh, uh, voting powers and particularly veto power in the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, uh, and why is this important? Because Kosovo has not been uh, able to join this organization from its independence uh, in 2008, uh, because membership in the UN goes through Security Council, uh, which in this case um, has to vote under the so-called substantial procedure and uh, uh, all permanent members of the Security Council has a veto power. So, and uh, so, uh, Russia is has threatened to use this veto power and will not uh, will block any future membership uh, of Kosovo in the in the UN as long as at least we don't have some sort of uh, normalization of relations with with Serbia. Uh, on the other hand, it's also not the UN, but it uh, it uses its influence elsewhere in uh, OEC and all other international uh, organizations, formal and informal organizations to block any uh, internationalization or legitimation of uh, Kosovo independent state in international relations. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, Serbia 
is uh, enabling Russia's influence in the region. Uh, and this is needed badly, at least uh, uh, since uh, uh, Russia has occupied Crimea back in 2014. And why does this, uh, is this of helpful for, for Russia? It's because it wants to draw attention, international attention from Ukraine and to create hotspots and to uh, create uh, uh, crisis situations elsewhere, such as in Western Balkans or Gaza or, or uh, in, in the Sahel region, as, as it was explained earlier by, by the previous speaker. And um, so this is purely transactional relationship in this re regards. And uh, there is uh, absurdity to, to as well to this, uh, uh, to this uh, actions. For example, on one hand, Russia um, opposes Kosovo's independence, but on the other hand, tries to uh, take a big chunk of uh, territory from a sovereign and independent state, trying to uh, resemble the situation uh, in Kosovo, which is totally nonsense in this, uh, in this regards. Uh, uh, to, to, uh, to go back to concrete uh, 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 influence, we see several uh, signs of this uh, malign uh, influence uh, in the region, not only in, in Kosovo, but also uh, in, in Macedonia, in Montenegro, where, and as, uh, as well as in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, uh, for example, we saw uh, what we are referring uh, recently as the hybrid activities uh, in, in Macedonia in a bid to uh, uh, undermine free and fair elections in Macedonia, as well as to undermine free and fair referendum for to join, to join NATO, NATO um, in, in, uh, in the North Macedonia, as well as the same situation developed in uh, Montenegro, uh, undermining free and fair elections there, as well as uh, undermining the referendum there to join uh, uh, for, for Montenegro to join NATO. In Kosovo, we saw, uh, uh, it, uh, of course, Dr. Kriestor has mentioned uh, recent uh, developments, um, recent crisis in Kosovo, but uh, this um, uh, influence, Russia's influence, and uh, to, uh, in a bit to destabilize Kosovo uh, came, um, uh, can be traced back to at least in a more concrete steps in 2015. And this coincides with uh, 2014, right? Uh, so right after um, Russia uh, occupied Crimea in 2014. So from there, uh, from then, uh, Russia tries to uh, inflate crisis in other parts of the world just to shift it's uh, uh, the, the world's attention from, from Ukraine and its actions there. So in 2005, in a very, very symbolic, uh, let's say, a gesture, we have a situation where a train uh, which was covered or uh, labeled by, uh, um, by labels stating Kosovo is Serbia and covered in a Serbian flag, leaving Moscow station and going through Belgrade and trying to enter Kosovo, which was very symbolic in this way. Uh, but of course, uh, we managed to stop it with the help of, uh, of course, international community and NATO peacekeeping force that is still in, in Kosovo. And then we have, um, uh, other um, uh, other hybrid activities, which culminated in this year, uh, only at the beginning of the year, we had um, a violent, uh, violent um, clashes in the northern part of Kosovo, which is adjacent to Serbia, very vulnerable to to Serbia's and Russian um, influence there, and throughout the city you could see uh, posters and signs of Wagner of um, Wagner of, of uh, uh, Russia Z insignia that depicts uh, 
uh, the uh, military sign that use uh, that the Russian army is using in Ukraine. Uh, and later, just uh, recently, we had this um, terrorist attack uh, where about uh, 100 men, fully armed men, uh, entered Kosovo in violation of uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Kosovo, uh, killed a police officer, and uh, uh, entered a monastery there until uh, they were pushed back by our uh, security forces. Uh, this action was totally organized, and there are clear signs that this action was organized by top uh, politicians and military uh, heads of uh, Serbia, uh, especially and particularly, we can refer to Alexander Vucic as president of Serbia, but uh, the main, let's say, organizer in this perspective was Alexander Vulin, uh, which who is uh, at, now is former head of uh, Serbian intelligence agency. Uh, Alexander Vulin was appointed recently, maybe I think two years, even less than two years ago, but uh, let's say two years ago, close, he was former minister of defense of Serbia, very close ally and friend of Serbian president uh, Alexander Vucic, and he only resigned uh, after the Western pressure uh, due to the latest events in, 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 in Kosovo. But somehow, uh, Alexander Vucic was amnest, amnest uh, uh, there is some sort of amnesty for uh, international amnesty for Alexander Vucic in this regard. Alexander Vulin visited only recently, uh, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, uh, 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 Russia and met with Alexander, uh, with uh, Russian President uh, Putin there. Uh, and so I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be glad to uh, discuss any uh, issues and comments you might have with this regards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rechai. Uh, and we now go to uh, Dr. Kochak. Dr. Kochak, Middle East dimension. Svetlusha, you want to interject or you? No, I'm not raising hands. I'm clapping for the speakers. Okay, clapping. Okay. So, Dr. Kochak, please take over. And then after Dr. Kochak, we'll try to have uh, uh, Nika finish the discussion on caucuses because something went wrong with, I guess, his, uh, his computer. All right, Ms. Dr. Kochak, please take over. All right, thank you very much for inviting me this to this uh, wonderful, actually, panel. I'm already learning so much, and I'm really proud to be um, proud to participate in this in this panel discussion. So um, the panel, the, the previous panelists before me spoke have already spoke about how um, Russia actually used certain, several tactics and strategies to 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 kind of um, to kind of destabilize multiple regions, and unfortunately, Middle East is one of them. So I will be um, trying to discuss um, the. the the Russia's uh, influence and strategies in the Middle East region, with particular attention to what's happening in between between Palestine and Israel right now. My name is Mohammed Kochak. I uh, work as assistant professor in Social Sciences University of Ankara in Turkey. Uh, I hold a PhD from Florida International University, and I'm focusing on Russian foreign policy and Russia-Turkey relations. So. Um, so when it comes to Russia's relations with the Middle East, I think it um, it resembles, I mean, when we talk about Russia's rising influence in the Middle East, I think uh, the topics and 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 the and the situation that that we are going to discuss will resemble uh, what Russia is doing in all the other uh, regions. So I think uh, what has been missing or not missing, but not touched upon uh, as much as uh, as much as I would like to see, was that the the, the diminishing in influence of the United States and Europe uh, in these regions. I think the Middle East is uh, is a wonderful example of this because in the Middle East we see a, a, a diminishing 
uh, both strategic as well as soft power influence of the United States, because after the Iraqi war and 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 the and and and, and the intervention to Afghanistan, the United States basically uh, throughout the 2010s, uh, especially starting with the Obama administration. Uh, kind of figured that well, uh, you know what we would not we, we would not like to uh, get much more involved in these regions. Instead, they um, they I mean that that had like two reasons. First, it was too costly for them for the United States because you invest a lot of it and uh, all you get was uh, the lose of soft power, millions of people dead, uh, you know the streets as well as the governments do not like you anymore. Plus, uh, China was a bigger danger for the United States, so they figured that they deflect all their attentions to China. So, so fast forward to the process of the Arab Spring. Uh, well, there were like hopes of uh, of getting rid of the dictatorship, totalitarian regimes across the Middle East, and you know replacing them with popular regimes. So when the flames of the Arab Spring or Arab uprisings uh, reached to Syria, everyone thought that the Assad regime is going to also go away, and uh, you know this whole regime will be replaced by a rather popular uh, government. However, this didn't occur because Syria was very important for uh, for Iran plus Russia. Um, so so they intervened especially the Iranian uh, paramilitary forces helped the Assad regime to basically quell the opposition very violently. So right now, uh, Assad regime basically um, basically controls um, close to like 50 to like 60 percent of the territory, as well as uh, Damascus and Aleppo. Uh, however, in northern Syria, as well as in eastern Syria, uh, the Syrian government does not have much control. So Russia was one of the uh, regional or great powers that has actually intervened uh, in Syria militarily along with Turkey and Iran. And Russia did this um, because an opportunity has arisen. Uh, Russia figured that, well, um, just, just in parenthesis, Russia's, I mean, it, it was already mentioned, but Russia basically aimed Aims in its uh, in its in its foreign policy strategy aims two things: first, uh, global instability and global multipolarity; second, uh, hegemony or uh, rising influence, rising Russian influence in multiple regions, be it in the in in the Central Asian Turkic world, be it in the Caucasus or the Middle East or Africa. So Russia uses the similar tactics uh, everywhere, uh, ranging from paramilitary forces. Um, hybrid warfare or direct military interventions. In contrast to what Russia did in, in Africa, Russia um, militarily involved uh, in Syria with its army, with its like ground forces, with its arm, with, it, with its air forces, and with its navy too. Because Russia also has a has a has a military base in in Humaymim, which is uh, near near the Mediterranean Sea. Russia wants to protect that. And you know, with a cheap and modest investment, Russia could actually uh, gain a foothold at the heart of the Middle East, at the expense of the Western power, as well as uh, the power of the Syrian people, or the power of the you know several regional actors, except Iran. So, in collaboration with Iran, Russia basically um, basically had an air superiority for much of the uh, Syrian territory and um, and could uh, be a very important stakeholder in the Middle East, in particularly in Levant. So this was very important for several actors for Turkey because you know Turkey has a um, Turkey has certain problems with, with the with the Kurdish separatists as well as the um, as well as the militant uh, terrorist groups in, that has emerged in Syria and Israel, uh, which is in competition and in, in, in violent or cold competition with Iran in the region. So since Syria and, and, and Israel has a, has a land connection, Israel was very worried. So let's, let me um, open another parenthesis here. 
for Israel-Russia relations. Um, well, Israel and Russia had like trade relations, yes, and 10% of Israelis actually speak Russian and they don't speak much Hebrew. So there is this like cultural and like people to people connection here as well. So Israel and Russia has like uh, good relations. However, with Russian forces being in Syria and with the Iranian forces threatening Israel, Russia actually had a chance to cut a deal uh, with Israel whereby uh, Israel would be protected or would be assured um, that the Iranian paramilitary forces will not uh, pose a military security threat to Israel. So the details of it is that, you know, the, the, the Iranian paramilitary forces would be 85 kilometers away from the Israeli border. Plus, um, Russia also turned a blind eye to, to, to Israelis hitting uh, certain targets within Syria. Uh, but in exchange for that, Israel basically did not um, did not did not apply any any kind of economic sanctions on Russia, um, you know, along with its Western partners. Plus, Israel did not uh, provide the uh, the requested security the, the requested um, security equipment uh, from Ukraine. So it so it goes both ways. So when the clashes between Gaza um, Palestinians and Israelis emerged, uh, Russia was at first hesitant to basically take sides. It just, you know, reiterated its original point, which is that, you know, we are, um, we are, we are for the two-state solution in, 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 in Palestine and we condemn, uh, you know, Hamas terrorism, etc., etc. But when Israel, um, Israel reacted um, to, 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 to the attack uh, from the Palestinians in a very violent way, which uh, claimed the lives of um, more than 10,000 people, most of them are children, um, and this created a very high outreach, not only in the East, but also in the West. Russia saw an opportunity to basically instrumentalize this growing outreach to basically just be a champion, uh, quote unquote, um, in world values, you know, human rights, etc., etc. You know, we see, we, we now hearing, or we've been hearing from Russian officials more and more about how uh, the U.S. or like Western solutions for Israel do not work. Um, how they, they 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 basically support Israel and they the killing of babies. How Russia is uh, for the human rights, etc. Without making any commitment, without like pushing Israel to basically comply with any kind of um, you know humanitarian solutions, etc., etc. So again, uh, just like in Syria or like in anywhere else, uh, Russia is um, Russia is making a big investment right now in in, in Palestine by pushing its own narrative uh, regarding human rights by basically just saying, look, uh, we as Russians, you know, we are great powers, um, and 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 you know the solutions that are that are offered by the by the West to the to the conflicts. Um, in the world do not work at all, just like it doesn't in, in between, between Israel and Palestine. Second, um, Russia is, you know, by doing that, Russia is also consolidating its influence in the Middle East. And third, and maybe most importantly and imminently, Russia is diverting focus uh, away from what's happening in Ukraine. Because um, just, before, um, just before this whole ordeal has started in Palestine, uh, everyone was talking about the human calamity in Ukraine caused and perpetuated uh, by Russia. But right now, you know, people are basically just becoming a little bit more anxious about clapping uh, for, you know, Western support for Ukraine because uh, Russia is saying, well, look, um, the West is hypocrite when it comes to Ukraine and Palestine. So, um, so, 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 so it should be given free hand to, to what to what he what what Russia is doing in um, in Ukraine. Um, well, well. To conclude again, um, there are multiple things, mul multiple uh, investment opportunities for Russia that's happening in Palestine, and Russia is using them within the framework of its strategy to 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 promote uh, global multipolarity and and the regional influence for 
Russia in the Middle East or in elsewhere. Thank you. So Thank it, you. Was, uh, it was an uh, interesting uh, conversation that we uh, heard from all of you. But I noticed a few things. And before anybody else, uh, uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, please raise your hand icon or type in your question in a, in a chat, and then we'll ask it for you. Um, and um, OK, so we have Alejandro. Alejandro, please go ahead, ask your question, and then I'm going to be asking something. Go ahead, Alejandro, if you can turn your microphone. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Professor. Thank you for inviting me to the lecture. Uh, I just wanted to say I appreciated everybody's time here. It's all very, very interesting. And I didn't have a question specifically uh, for any particular person, but just anybody who feels free to answer it. Um, how do you people see the evolution of the European Union as far as their stances on defense and mutual defense evolving in the face of what Russia is doing, essentially. Um, I've heard since the beginning of the conflict, a lot of people have been expecting uh, Article 5 to be invoked in some way or another, um, whether willing or not. And it's very interesting to me that, you know, the conflict is as close to Poland as it is, for example, and there aren't any steps being taken concretely on that level of organization against a potential conflict. So I kind of just wanted your your guys' views on potential that. Potential expansion of the conflict, or put, or rather just regarding the Ukraine? Well, specifically, um, hard politics. So in, in terms of military expansion and in terms of uh, control, essentially. All right. Okay, so anybody wants to chip in on that? Um, go ahead, uh, Dr. Korchak. Yes. Um... Well, essentially, the, the European Union or Europe does not have its own um, security organization, but it does have NATO, which is basically um, basically where uh, the United States is very influential. Well, actually, we should not be uh, we, sh we should not forget that the United States has been very influential also for the foundation of NATO, for, for the foundation of the EU, which makes actually the relations between Europe and Russia um, a, a, a trans-Atlantic um, one, um, meaning uh, the European agency um, for its for, for, for its security relations between Russia and the EU has not been very high um, because of the involvement of the United States and the and the competition or global competition for influence uh, between Russia and um, and 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 the and the United States. That doesn't mean that um, Russia's Russia's threat um, of expansion, or the or the expansion or the threat of the expansion of the conflict from Ukraine westwards um, is only a transatlantic one. It's actually a regional one too. It's actually a regional Eastern European one. But uh, the nature of the security arrangements. Um, with regard to the uh, involvement of NATO, makes it look like so. So, so, so anytime something is happening, the United States is involved and makes uh, it harder for the European Union to resolve the problem, um, to resolve the problem regionally with Russia. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the European Union is a is a is 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 not, is not really much of a union because the Russian uh, threat to Poland um, is not is not is not as high of a threat to um, threat to say Spain or 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 or, or Netherlands. So they are always in disagreement uh, as to how they, uh, they 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 have to react to the to the Russian expansion. So there is that too. So there are like multiple challenges um, in. The European Union's, you know, reaction uh, to the to the to, to the Russian to the apparent Russian expansion or the apparent Russian threat, um, and Russia is using them. Russia is sowing the seeds of uh, of 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 discontent uh, in between Europe, or between Europe and the United States, or in bit or within uh, the European countries uh, through funding uh, far right and far left organizations. I okay. think that's the summary of it. 
Okay, great. So listen, um, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Korchak. Um, as I was listening to all of you, I see all of you really avoiding to answer the question that we posed today, right? Um, all of you are basically somewhat, um, you know, presenting the case around it, but uh, I'm, I, I would love to hear from you, give us a little more meat, right? Uh, uh, as Dr. Breslin would say, put, stick your, you know, <laughs> your neck up, uh, uh, you know, forward and tell us, right, is really, uh, do you think to what extent Russia is involved in this, uh, um, in this, you know, places, and, uh, you know, obviously we would need to hear some sort of more substance in terms of why would we think it is and why would we think it is not. So, um, you know, Dr. Gapa was talking about interesting things, right, about these uh, regional identities, which essentially somewhat play a role for young Sahelians. Um, she was talking about potentials of Niger, uranium, oil, and talking about gold in Mali. And that anti-colonial kind of sentiment, which which Russia tries to exploit, exploit. But you know, um, to what extent do you think Russia is involved directly? Like, is this really just happen, and then Russia is next door to it, or um, is it Russia involved? And does Russia play actually uh, a role in that thing to satisfy these the specific uh, goals? So my assessment of the situation is that I did not find a lot of evidence to actually show uh, the Russian footprint in a direct manner uh, in the case of the Niger coup. Where there was some direct engagement would be in Mali, uh, where um, even the coup leaders were seeking out support from Russia. But most of the engagement within the region um, has been in the Central African Republic, which is just outside of the Sahel region, as well as in Mali. So most of this assessment is where could Russia go with this and the template that has been set in uh, the Central African Republic and in Mali. So in the Central African Republic, the Wagner Group is actually the presidential guard. They are the ones who provide the logistics for um, the transportation of the president, for the military logistics within the, the country. Um, and- So president's okay. safety and security depends yes. on- the detail yeah. is basically Wagner. Okay. So maybe, as if I understand what you're saying, so uh, this is how it goes, right? Like, while international community may be surprised about what's happened, what happened in Nigeria, Russia is not, and that's the uh, extent that we can say, right? Um, no, Russia is already on top of things. It's already seeing this trend of dissatisfaction, low cost, low um, rise. Uh, low standard of living in these areas, a crisis of legitimacy with these uh, leaders who have not been able to provide public goods to the citizens, uh, as well as the grip of uh, French uh, neocolonialism. Uh, I mean, as we know, the CFA franc is the main currency within uh, West African countries, uh, which are francophone. Uh, so it's it, 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 So I think the assessment by Russia is more in uh, understanding the underlying factors that are causing these grievances within the populations. And so therefore, it... was... mm -hmm. yeah, there will be it's another so... kind of, another clash with, with France, right? So there is already somewhat tension between France in Mediterranean, and now there's going to be another between Russia and France in Sahel region. I would assess that to be the case, except that in both cases with France as well as in Russia, um, none of them are interested in outright conflict. So it's more of, est uh, of establishing uh, patronage systems, which still allow them to get, um, you know, the financial gains as well as the, the gains of, of having uh, a leader who's loyal to either one of them. So they just want to have that hand within the pot. Uh, as opposed to direct engagement. I did not see any evidence to suggest that they would be willing to engage militarily in any of these places, spe especially in Niger. Even upon an in invitation, because the, the, the leader went to Russia afterwards? 
Uh, potentially, yes. But um, from what I have seen uh, from my analysis, it's Russia, both Russia and France do not want uh, military engagement. It, do, they do not want uh, Niger to disintegrate into a conflict. No. So that means the, the, the thing happened and it just looks like it's playing more in the Russian court rather than in any other courts, right? I would say so, yes, correct. Okay, great. So now um, let's ask also Dr. Uh, Retsai. Um, Dr. Retsai, you know, you, you did put some allegations here regarding, you know, situation in Kosovo. Um, but I'd like to ask you, right, okay, so what happened with that story? Somewhat uh, the story was very much alive. And then, um, and then, uh, uh, um, it died down. So we don't know really what happened since. Like uh, some people were captured after. Is that, yeah, Dr. H. H. Uh, some people were captured. So did, uh, did any new information came regarding that particular incident where, where, as you said, almost 100 people, 100 armed people essentially took part of, took over the, the, the small town of, uh, of uh, in North Kosovo and, and that monastery. Do we have any more information? Is there any other kind of things that can maybe point to Russian involvement? Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I'm. It seems that I'm having trouble with video conferencing. So I will just. Uh, uh, is it okay if I can continue only? Sure. If, sure. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I think the internet. I'm, in my office and some some maybe it's friday after four o'clock they are doing something maybe some backup or something because they do it on fridays and maybe because of that so just to relate to your uh, uh, first question uh is russia uh, coming back to as a world uh, player and uh, and uh, and how that influence is going to be uh, formed and to be asserted um I think that um, we, with the uh, situation in Ukraine, we see uh, a Russia that uh, was not in our Im imagination, actually. We see a, a state which is um, a strong state, but it's not a superpower. Uh, we see a state that is uh, uh, very isolated in the world. Uh, and we see a state that, um, uh, uh, does not stand to resemble what was USSR uh, before that. And when I'm talking about USSR, I'm talking about a, a superpower that was uh, balancing against the West at that time. So a USSR was able to exert influence elsewhere in the world because uh, it was in order to be a superpower, you not only have to have military equipment, but you also have to have uh, economic um, uh, uh, power as well as other uh, uh, material uh, support. And just not to uh, refer to, I can just refer to uh, Joseph Nye, that you have to have smart power. You know, you have to have hard power and soft power, which uh, I think still currently only US has. And uh, so this can be also seen in Azerbaijan, what happened in Azerbaijan, and uh, uh, a staunch ally of Russia lost its, uh, let's say, control of a territory inside the sovereign state, Nagorno-Karabakh, which was held for many years. Of course, it was illegally, for, for, from my perspective and for, for, uh, from the perspective of the whole world, but it was a factual situation that was enabled by Russia. And uh, now we see a staunch supporter of an ally of Russia that is leaning towards the West and is accusing Russia of alienating and of uh, actually uh, treating uh, as a traitor of, of Armenia's cause in this regard. So Russia, uh, although it wishes to be more directly involved in the world, but it doesn't have power first and foremost because they are heavily engaged in ukraine so they the main focus is, is in ukraine so what they are trying to do and will do in the future and have done so far is to incite a crisis situation through 
uh, other means which are mainly seen as or, or referred to as hybrid activities. So it's either information space or um, uh, financial support or ideological support. And uh, when they have uh, more support local, they, they need to rely on local support somehow to enable these crisis situations. And this is how they are doing in Western Balkans. This is how they are using Serbia. They are using this alliance of commit uh, of convenience and the uh, an alliance of autocars because it's interesting that Putin is all allies with with Serbia and Ale because it's Ale Alexander Vucic there an autocrat as well as he is somehow in alliance with a EU NATO member Hungary with Viktor Orban so this is how. So, uh, and Russia is uh, uniting all autocrats and dictators all around the world in order to uh, uh, exert an influence through these. So they are, these are like proxy uh, activities, extended arms, uh, arms of Russia in, in, in different regions. So okay. uh, in the current situation in Kosovo, yeah, we, we saw, uh, we saw uh, a... Uh, European Parliament resolution that uh, deplored uh, the events in, in Kosovo and uh, also earlier European Parliament resolution uh, stating that uh, Russia is involved through diff uh, different uh, activities in the Balkans, not only in Kosovo as well, but also as, as well as in other parts of the Balkans. And so what we saw is we saw resignation of Alexander Vulin as chief of uh, of uh, yeah, but did of, we, uh, did we, Dr. Reche, did we do we have any new information? Like people were some people were captured. That's what the media yes, reported. Yes, no, I, I no, do we I, have we any don't, new information yeah. about who the people are? I mean, some some concrete evidence because what we hear we hear mostly allegations, allegation, yeah. allegation, allegation. Okay, so we need some sort of meat. Do we have some concrete evidence or something specific? That we have learned since the conflict, from at least you know, I I assume that yeah. the authorities have uh, questioned these uh, people who the, who were captured, and so what happened since? Concrete means is that um, I mean from Russia, you mean? No, I'm talking oh, about directly from Russia, and then from, uh, from, yeah, I'm uh, about concretely from... we 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 had a, an unprecedented unprecedented uh, military build up in South and. Serbia, which is in the, in the border with Kosovo, uh, thousands of military personnel with heavy armaments stationed around Kosovo, at least from the May or even earlier than that, that were uh, also triggered um, international concern about a uh, potential invasion of, uh, of by so Serbia. Richard, all, these things, all these things we have heard already. Okay. I'm asking okay. since... No? That Bainska incident, there were yes. I think four or five or six, I forgot how many people, how many three. of these men three, were three captured. Of, yeah. Yeah. Three so of them do we are, have any uh, more yeah. information about no. exactly who they were, what they were doing, other than all these things that we have heard from you and from other players, right? That this is probably Russia, that this is probably... Right. Um, so that's essentially important. And while Dr. Echa is uh, uh, answering anyone ask a question, we will be happy to to I see there is one at least. Go ahead. No, no in this regards, I don't uh, we don't have any at least I don't have any I mean, in, let's say like concrete information, but um, uh, uh, maybe it's uh, it's confidential still because we have three people that are under arrest and three others were killed in the actions and uh, maybe uh, the police already has some uh, concrete information about the how the whole event unfolded. Okay, there is an interesting question posed in the chat by uh, by Mr. Lazarevsky. If Mr. Lazarevsky wants to. Uh, ask in person, you're welcome to turn on your microphone. Otherwise, I will read it for you. Um, um, he's talking about uh, your your expose, uh, Dr. Echai's expose on Russian involvement in the incursions and its meddling in the Balkans in general. 
And he then says that there was a Russian Orthodox priest who was expelled from North Macedonia after being exposed as an agitator on behalf of the Russian Secret Service. So Russian influence in North Macedonia is quite substantial, and it is anchored in the idea of Pan-Slavism and Orthodox Brotherhood. However, something else that I have observed, uh, that's what Lazarevsky says, is that Russia's influences uh, uh, has wanted after Macedonian accession to the NATO. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Echai his take on what he thinks Russia's end game for the Balkans is. Are the Balkans merely a bargaining, bargaining chip for Russia or does do you think that Russia is, uh, sees um, having a foothold in the Balkans as the geostrategic asset? After all, Russia and Serbia have long-standing historical cultural ties, and that he's thanking for insightful presentation. Uh, so what is your comment, Dr. Acha? Yes, thank you very much uh, well, uh, uh, for your comments, um, uh, Mr. Lazarevsky. As well as yeah, uh, on top of that, the Macedonian authorities uh, have um, um, discovered a center of activities which was doing in misinformation. They were involved in uh, uh, cyberspace in um, uh, placing. Uh, uh, misinformation as well as fake news. So, uh, and this base was in, uh, I don't remember right now, but it's in one part, I think in so Southeast Macedonia somewhere there. And they uh, discovered this place, this hub of people working to influence the opinion in uh, of the people in Macedonia, but as well as in the, uh, in, the, in the region and the world. So again, to go back to your question, um, I think that um, I mentioned that in my uh, in my presentation that we are an uh, enclave within the Euro-Atlantic zone, and uh, I think that uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, and other uh, countries, being NATO members, are quite secure. On top of that, they are buffer zone because they don't uh, Russia does not have direct link to to uh, uh, to Macedonia without uh, passing through a, a NATO member state, state, which is very good. That provides us very uh, comfortable situation in a way that we can easily, if we are ready to do that, we can uh, quite easily counterbalance uh, those uh, malign influence uh, that is Russia trying to to do in the in the Balkan. I think that Russia knows that. Uh, Serbia knows that, and uh, but what they want to do is, uh, Russia wants to do is just to use, to to uh, abuse with the current situation, the tensions between, mainly tensions between Serbia and Kosovo and uh, tensions within Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they, uh, by, uh, by supporting uh, elites, political elites, uh, that are nationalists in their political programs, uh, maybe even propagating uh, Orthodox Brotherhood agendas. Uh, we can see that Russia is um, is uh, playing by this uh, Orthodox card because they they want to be um, the main uh, supporter as well as defender of Orthodoxy all around the world. So. Uh, Russia is using all kinds of uh, kinds of um, uh, 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 relationships and uh, belongings in order to to force alliances, which are uh, mainly uh, in the, in the, in the, to the benefit of holding President Putin and alike like him in power. Maybe uh, at least in Russia, in its near abroad policy, as well as elsewhere in the in the world. Because, but when you see it in the in the from the other side, it's very absurd. Because when we see 
the war in Ukraine, we see a, let's say, Orthodox uh, Jewish Muslim alliance, if I can uh, refer to that. So I'm, I'm very careful about using this, this term, but so we have a president, uh, we have a, a mainly Orthodox country, Ukraine, with a president which, uh, who is the Jewish and the minister of defense who is Muslim against an Orthodox Muslim alliance there. We have uh, Russia, mainly Orthodox, and, and the Chechen um, Republic and uh, Ramzan Kadyrov. So it's, uh, the religion is being abused in this uh, just a means in order to achieve some political gains there. So I think that Russia uh, knows that and just tries to shift attention to, to, to shift uh, the Western resources and Western attention to other countries in order to achieve its goals in its near abroad, mainly in Ukraine as the main priority, but elsewhere in the world. Okay, that's great. All right, thank you. So we're going to wrap up now. I just have one question for Nika and one question for Dr. Kochak before we finished. And uh, it is interesting to see that Dr. Recha is essentially saying that uh, Russia is using same geopolitical goals or strategies like Soviet Union, where they are relying on local players to achieve some sort of you know ambiguities, where then they have a more role to play uh, globally. So, uh, uh, Dr. Estashvili, uh, you know, let's uh, kind of. You know, this notion that uh, Russia is somehow protector of orthodoxy and, you know, this like that. Well, in, in the case of Azerbaijan, that falls apart, right? Because it is exactly that orthodox country have essentially um, lost, right? Uh, and uh, Russia was just observing and doing nothing to prevent the uh, the fallout of, of essentially uh, of the remaining parts of Nagorno-Karabakh while perhaps, perhaps, uh, I don't know to what extent, but there is a conversation about Israel being involved on the side of, of Azerbaijan, uh, uh, crucially involved on the side of Azerbaijan, which again makes it difficult to understand even what Dr. Kochak was saying, where Russia and Israel have some sort of um, uh, mutual agreements, but how the uh, I mean, uh, how the Russia and Israel agreements work in terms of Russia, or rather Israel being directly involved in Azerbaijan um, as far as these reports are correct. So now, Dr. Istashvili, uh, what do you think is the essentially a new paradigm developing in the Caucasus after the Azerbaijan asserted its control, after the Armenia had to withdraw? What do you think is the next? I mean, I was essentially very much hoping to hear what is happening with Gruzia. Yeah, Things kind of somehow died down. The Gruzia is crucially important for both sides of of, uh, of the Caucasus, but somehow things are very quiet there. So does this what happened is in Azerbaijan reflects in Gruzia? What the Gruzian um, le officials think, how they positioning themselves in light of new things that happen in Azerbaijan? So hi again, and uh, again, pleasure being here. Uh, so, oh. What I'm seeing here, uh, um, it's not a, a coincidence that I use regional security complex theory because Barry Buzan, all the way, were already predicted what's going on in uh, this region about 20 years ago. So if we read their book in 2023, they had already said that Russia would be losing their power. What was uh, going to be happening is that European Union was going to be encroaching into Caucasus. Azerbaijan would probably be re regaining Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenia would be turning again from Russia towards probably European Union or Iran. So um, like probably Caucasus would be turning into a playing region among whom United States, European Union, Turkey, Iran, playground, and Russia. So Russia is going to be weakening, and everybody else is going to be entering the region. So it's becoming a playground, according to them. 
Russia weakening, everybody else entering into a region. So the region was, according to, again, regional security complex theory, was completely centered on Russia. Russia, a dominant power, everybody else outside of the region, everybody else like outside completely. But now Russia, simply as a weakened power, has to put up with everybody entering region. Imagine already in 2023, Barry Buzan and all the way were the guys who are representatives of English school and Copenhagen school combined had written this. And like, uh, uh, so what's going to happen in the future? Georgia, like, again, like, uh, we have now the government that pretends to be neutral, yeah, because they pretend to be neutral, yeah. I, by, by the way, work for this government. And I don't only teach teach in the, like, um, universities, but I work for the government. I'm an academician, so I can talk in this way. So, uh, like, they say that they are neutral, that's why they don't talk loud against Russia or pro-Europe. They say that they are pro-European or pro-United States, but they don't say it loud not to make Russia angry or like not to like, you know, be hurt by anybody. So yesterday we got like, uh, again, like from Europeans, we said that you are like gonna be accepted to European Union, but you have like nine like conditions to fill in. You are doing really badly. You are gonna be accepted maybe in a few years to European Union, but you still have to fulfill these nine requirements, which you are really doing badly. So we gotta do all of these things and we're doing really badly in terms of fulfilling these requirements. Now, again, Georgian government is like pretending to be, I, I want to emphasize, to be pro-Western and pro-European, not to piss off Russians. We are not fulfilling the requirements. So you see, we are playing this double game. So you're like, basically waiting to see, right? You're waiting we to are see. waiting to see. So what we need to do basically as Georgian people, and we understand this really well, is to get rid of this government and bring on some government with a face which is either pro-European or really pro-Russian and really take our, choose our side. But I don't know, are we going to do that? Because in the elections, this government is going to falsify the elections or we are going to bring the government which is like really going to choose the sides. But because so if I understand correctly, Nika, that means what happened in, in Azerbaijan reflects in Gruzia. Basically, Gruzia is saying, hmm, let's kind of hold on and let's kind of pull back and see you know, whether the European commitment really means anything. And because if it doesn't, then we, uh, like last time when Gruzia started or, or tried to to regain the, the control of its territory, Russia moved in and took more. You know, I don't think that like uh, people are uh, either smart or not smart. It just, it reflects more that we don't trust the parties who represent us. So the, we don't trust the ruling party, but we also don't trust the opposition party who is going to represent, who represents us. But it more does not trust like overall the, like, uh, the uh, governing system. We now have a majority governing system, but if we had the multi-party ruling system, yeah, then I think we would like be choosing the parties yeah and the coalition governance and then i think we would undoubtedly be tilting towards europe and nato but now because we have a majority system this reflects the things that we are always choosing the party that we really don't like majority of the government does not like but because of the majority governance ruling system we are still choosing the party we don't like one way or another yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I expressed myself correctly, but like yeah, proportional clearly. representation, proportional representation will be more representative. Yes. Um, okay, so uh Svetlusha, you asked the question about uh, how Georgian status uh, candidate uh to uh, status candidate to U European Union will affect the further development in the region. And as you hear from uh from Nika, uh essentially they're you know, talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Um, before we go to Dr. Korchak, we have a question, uh, Mr. Pavlov uh, or uh, 
well, please you introduce yourself and ask your question if you can. I, my Kuta, Pablo, I see their hand is raised. Go ahead. Okay, microphone is on. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, uh, my Pablo, uh, you, you know, your question can be asked afterwards. So, Dr. Korchak, right? You you mentioned that's quite an interesting thing that uh, uh, security arrangement that you noted uh, between Russia and Israel about you know securing uh, the northern border, right, while essentially holding the ground in in Syria. So now this is really a question like there is a conversation about uh, Israeli involvement in Azerbaijan which makes uh, Iran very nervous um, that also somewhat reflects on Turkey and um, certainly you know I don't I don't know exactly how Russia looks at that potential involvement in the Caucasus by Israel whether that will reflect what you think in the current situation uh, in and around Israel and Palestine so I think um, I think I need to underline um, a very important point again. Uh, I think the point that uh, the Western institutions, be it the European Union or NATO or the United States itself, and their promises and their security commitments are not, um, you know, bought by uh, by the by the local actors, uh, be it like regional powers, middle powers. They just don't trust uh, the United States or the European Union. So they so they do not want to put all their eggs in the same uh, you know the Western baskets just uh, just like as it is now happening <clears throat> as as my friend Nika has established in with with, with Georgia but also with uh, you know other countries in 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 the Balkans and in the Middle East uh, with Turkey with Israel with North Macedonia you know they just don't want to be um, out in the cold when Russia is there with the, with all their hard power. With um, you know, with with their with their security commitments and with their partners. So in this kind of kind of um, environment where the West is supposed to be there, like overwhelmingly with um, as as a hegemonic power, or but in reality it isn't just there and not promising to be there. With the United States is focusing on China and you know do not want to really um, take the whole burden of. Of, of, of being a gender Maria forces of the world. Well, um, this kind of situation actually leaves Russia a room for influence, a cheap influence actually. I mean, Russia does not have to be uh, like, a, like, a, like a Western player or you know, providing, a, providing a comprehensive security um, to, 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 to the local actors. Russia, I mean, it's, it's, it's important for Russia to be um, or it is, you know, enough for Russia to be a spoiler actor, you know, making, um, sowing seeds of, seeds of, um, seeds of disappointment towards the West, so that Russia maybe, you know, um, may appear as an alternative actor with like small investments. Uh, so I think that's an important point. So, so when we look at all you... these traces, no, I heard your question, and I'm going to come to that. So when we look at all those traces, you know, um, I think we're asking the wrong question. I mean, whether Russia is like directly involved, whether Russia is doing that. I think the mere um, truth that we are talking about Russian influence in these regions is enough for Russia because we are talking about Russian influence. We, you know, whether whether, whether or not Russia is there, you know, supporting all these actors are, you know, secondarily important because because you know, when we ask these questions and we are actually, you know, it's legitimate for us to ask, to be asking these questions is that, you know, we actually, um, you know, subliminally so accept that, you know, the US and the West is losing power and Russia is a, is, a, is a very important actor, not just, you know, in its near abroad, but also, you know, in faraway regions. I think this is very important for, 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 for all, you know, small actors, local actors, you know, states, tribes, or whatever you think of in 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 all the you know corners of the world. When you ask about uh, the Israel-Azerbaijan connection, Israel and Azerbaijan has like special relations. 
yes, Azerbaijan Turkey relations are very good, uh, but you know, Azerbaijan being a, being an ex Soviet Republic um, actually has, um, you know, a sizable Jewish community. And, you know, there are a lot of, also a lot of Azerbaijanis in Israel too. So with this connection, I think, um, actually they capitalized on this connection and made certain security and energy agreement with Israel, with that Israel is providing weapons, you know, be it like um, unmanned aerial vehicles or like, you know, with Iron Dome and everything to Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan providing gas to Israel through um, through through the Baku Tbilisi Jehan um, oil, no oil. Oh, Azerbaijan providing oil to Israel, and also Israel providing support uh, support to Azerbaijan through uh, the Jewish lobbies in the United States. Um, so they have a very special arrangements. I think it's making wonders for Azerbaijan because. It is at a disadvantaged position um, in the West because of the sizable Armenian diaspora. Yeah. Okay. So, so that probably is making Iran nervous, and we are opening new cans and new cans. But I cannot not ask you. So, what are you saying essentially is the Russia will like the conflict, current conflict in around Gaza, to continue? Is that what I understand from what you're saying? Uh, essentially, I would they say yes, certainly, to be resolved because the yes. conflict, continuing yes, conflict, because, that, you know, benefits them. Because you know, the more conflictual the world is, the better it is for Russia. Because when everything is stable, you know, controlled, uh, you know, Russia, um, an aspiring superpower without the capacity to to be so, you know, Russia can't do that. Russia needs to be a spoiler. Right. Actor, you know, uh, as a, as a secondary power. So being a spoiler, you need conflict. If you, if you know, um, so in those situations where you cannot, you know, create conflict, and the conflict is actually there, it's good for you because you know you do not spend any kind of energy, and and there is a conflict, and you know you Absolutely. you you boost, you push yourself as a as a stakeholder, yes. as a as a as a as an influential actor you you put like question marks of the of the, of the western influence etc etc i think so yeah is many goals achieved yeah point. excellent thank you thank you people very much um it was quite an interesting conversation uh, i hope everybody understands that we had people basically covering four continents of the world Pretty much only, you know, China was missing, right, or India, right? But uh, because there was a, a report uh, two days ago, there was some sort of clashes between India and Pakistan. So we'll see whether how that will develop. Uh, but it was quite an interesting to see uh, this global perspective from all of you. And so, unfortunately, it looks like the news are bad. It looks like this uh, instability will continue, and this instability will essentially cause more um, expansion of the conflicts because this uh, current hegemon, the United States, is not able to anymore keep things under the control.